What's up, guys? We're live. Mike had to give me two thumbs up twice. We're back, guys. So today we're back on the regular yeah, Roll with the fun. Fox uh, so one month, monthly edition, once a month, every first Friday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, we have a full program. I, I have a lot of questions. Uh, but guys, don't hesitate to ask questions because whatever is asked live, gets preferenced over the questions that have come in over the last few days, all right? Um, let's get right to it. Um, I had a question from uh, Richardus uh, from, uh, I believe, Lithuania. All right, Lithuania. So um, how do we, you know, how do I escape the anaconda and then how do I deal with sort of front headlock turtle? So. Let's go over the anaconda first. Um, so if I'm caught in an anaconda, so go ahead. When I, so usually we wind up on our side. This is, this is usually the strongest possible way. So you could always try to push with your top arm, but it's easy for Enrique to, to counter my top arm. So go ahead, with his leg. So he can always take it away with, with his leg. So rather than, Rather than um, uh, pushing with the top arm, especially if you, if you don't have a lot of power, there's not going to be a lot of power here. Uh, first of all, I don't want to have my elbow to elbow. If I'm elbow to elbow, my, my, my lifting power is going to be very weak. So first thing I do is I, put, I go to uh, armpit to armpit. <laughs> yes, armpit to armpit. So armpit to armpit. And what I'm going to try to do is push push with the bottom hand. You're going to have a lot better success with the bottom hand. It's a lot harder for him to counter. Now, obviously, if everything is crunched up and it's just too late, it just might be too late, guys. At that point, you tap and you try it again. But first thing, armpit to armpit, bottom hand goes on the elbow and you start to push. Use your head also. So don't just use your hand power. So let's look at it this way. So I'm not just pushing with my hand but I'm also driving my head down, all right? Once I'm, guys, once I'm escaped, I'm going after him. Now he's gonna pay for his transgression <laughs> with, guys, if you saw the preview, I'm, I've been playing a lot with this, this idea of stockade, where my arm goes under his armpit, and that's when we're gonna break him down, but we're not gonna be talking about that today. But as soon as I escape, I'm going after him. If we have any questions on that, guys, write them down. Otherwise, I keep moving right along. Uh, and lots of peers said, uh, I got your instructional. It was brilliant. Thank you. I really appreciate it, guys. I appreciate uh, you buying the armbar instructional on uh, BJJ Fanatics. And especially if you guys uh, have given me a, gr a good review. There's so far 11. All five stars so far. So thank you, guys. Um, um, yes, guys, if you're looking for it, it's live. It's on BJJ Fanatics. Just put in Fox, and you'll find it. All right, so uh, it's let's called look. called Armbox from Everywhere. No, it's Armbars from Everywhere. They don't have the keywords right. <laughs> I don't know what it's called, guys. They don't have the keywords right, so just go, just put it, type it in the box, Fox. Type it in the box, Fox. I'm a poet, and I didn't wow. even know it. I knew it. <laughs> All right, so put a fox in the box, and it will come up. Anyways, let's move right along, guys. So um, let's look at what do I do if, if, if I wind up in a turtle, and um, obviously there's a threat of a guillotine, there's a threat of anaconda, there's a threat of dars. So you, there's a lot of threats that you need to be, be aware of. So if I'm in the wind up, sort of uh, the guys attacking from north south and I'm in a turtle so guys first thing I want to do is make sure I'm trying to prevent him from connecting hands ideally I'd like to stop his choking hand before it gets on my chin into a chin strap position but if um, if it gets to chin strap position you're gonna have a hard time peeling it so once it gets here I I have a hard time peeling it because if I do I start to expose my arms or him spinning around to take my back. So if he gets 
to uh, to the chin strap position. What I'll do is I'm going to try to stop his hips getting close to me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push forward. And I know that usually when you push forward, the guy is going to start to go for a guillotine. As this is happening, I want to get my head underneath his torso. Okay? I don't want to stay off to the side. I want to get my head underneath his torso. And now I'm going to... I'm going to sit back, all right? If you watched the antivirus edition, 99 episodes, guys, you know exactly where I'm headed with this. Split guard, yes. So let's look at it from a different angle. So again, you want to make sure that he doesn't set up his chokes. So... When I'm here, what I'll do is I'll try to stop his hand from coming in, but a lot of times his hand comes in um, and ha gets a chin strap. So I'm preventing, trying to prevent the second hand from connecting. All right? Uh, you, you don't want it to connect in a strong manner. Once it's in it, it, job, it's going to be a lot harder. So again, one is okay. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm tucking my chin somewhat, but I want to fold. All right? So what I'm doing is, is one hand kind of tries to peel this off, it's not possible. I'm gonna put my hand on his leg and now I'm gonna fold, all right? I'm gonna try to fold towards the side that, he's, that his hand that's potentially choking me is on. If I go the other way, it's just too easy for him to switch hands and continue to dominate my neck, my head, all right? So I'm gonna fold. And I'm trying to get my foot on him. Once it's on, guys, I'm going to now try to hit him with split guard. And tables have to turn dramatically. I should have stretched. Oh, are we, gonna, uh, are we doing this? All right. I thought you got it out of your system during the 99 episodes. Oh. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. I hope everybody from the antivirus tribe is on. So let's look at it one more time because my next question, and this one is from GM Baseball, is about the split guard. All right. So again, I get caught here. I'm just trying to make sure that I don't, he doesn't connect in a way that, that would threaten me severely. What I'm going to try to do is put one hand on his leg and I'm just trying to. Even if you hold on, hold on real tight, hold on tight, hold on tight. A lot tighter. Relax. That's it. And now I'm going into split guard. Briefly, I did get concerned that we're going to have a repeat of episode 19, except reverse. Yeah. <laughs> episode 91. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Yeah, episode 91. <laughs> All right, guys, we, I think we have to figure out a way to do this more than once a month because clearly there's too much screwing around going on here. <laughs> we, can, we have to get it out of our systems a little bit more often than once a month. Do we have any questions on this so far, Mike? Yes, uh, and also everybody's chiming in saying it's great to be back. Adolfo Fernandez is asking, Fox, at the end of that move, when one ends up in split guard, I'm having an issue when the guy shoves my right foot off the hip down between his legs and then he steps over and passes. Okay. Um, that's similar question to uh, Greg, GM Baseball. Um, he has a little bit different issue. The, the, the problem is if you put somebody in a split guard, so let's, let's recreate from this position, but... We're going to take it now from split guard. So as I'm folding over, I have to make sure that I get my foot on the hip. I don't, I don't try to get it on the leg because it's too easy to slip off. So I try to get it on the hip as soon as I possibly can. And then get the second one on the hip as well. All right, so let's look at it again, sort of uh, semi-live. So he texts me. I'm going straight to the hip. Now... This is where the biggest mistake that people make, and I, I believe uh, uh, Greg is also making a very similar mistake. And we'll, we'll go over what happens when his, what his training partner does. But the biggest mistake is, watch Enrique's face. Look at, look at the camera. 
look at the ca- look at the camera. So he's laughing. You you could see his ch- face changed. What changed? Can somebody give me an answer? <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Does somebody know what changed? Because this is the key when you're playing split guard. It, it's key. And I'm sometimes guilty of it myself when I get lazy. When I get too comfortable, too lazy. Uh, everybody's asking for please more than uh, once a month. <laughs> Guys, as soon as I get my academy back on track, uh, I will try to make something happen a little more often than once a month. Eric Ham says elbow pressure. Jim Taylor says knee pressure on the arm. GM, GM Baseball says pain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, pain is, yeah, pain is the result. Pain is the result. So I, I'm going to do it again. And again, I'm going to try to get there from Turtle. Uh, uh, when I turtle up, guys, I don't, I don't wait in turtle for too long. I Im- Im- immediately try to fold and attack. So, for example, what I'll usually do is say, if, if, you know, the guy just, and here we go. So now let's go back in the middle. So I didn't even have to go through him threatening potential uh, guillotine, anaconda, or dars. All right. So let's go in the middle. Guys, now pay, pay particular attention. Don't pay attention to Enrique's feet. Pay attention to my movement. It's going to be very subtle. <laughs> you should have stretched Enrique because... I did. There are things cracking. So the key to split guard is. Can I say squeezing the knees? No, not so much. Yeah, but that that is part of it. You want you do want to squeeze your knees. Tension in the feet, guys. Tension in the feet. So you're not pushing him out, but you sort of have that tension in the feet. When you start playing with this, you will realize immediately how much the threat level goes from yellow, way past orange, to purple. Is it higher than red? It is. Okay. So ultraviolet. <laughs> ultraviolet purple. <laughs> start playing with this because that is the single biggest mistake people make. First of all, to play effectively the split guard, you do need to have both feet on the hips is preferable. At least one, but preferably both. Because anytime, if I'm in a butterfly guard, he can start, he can move slightly forward to alleviate the pressure and the tension in his arm, which to some extent neutralizes the potential attacks that I have. So I can always, you know, when he's coming in, I can use his motion to, to, to sort of sweep him. So I'm going to do from butterfly guard. So I have a Urikatami, for example. I can always sweep him. But, you know, that's, uh, if, if you have a guy that's way bigger than you are uh, and has good base, it's not that easy. I prefer to, uh, you have to use, and you have to time it perfectly when he's coming in. I prefer to have both feet on the hips. But when you have both feet on the hips, guys, uh, just, you could do it with, with your hand, like sitting in front of the computer right now or in front of your phone. It, it, there's a difference between this and this. You could see like the tension in my, it's not like a big movement. It's not like I'm going to push him out three feet. No, all it is, is just putting tension in your legs. You will immediately get his attention. And you could see that it, the, 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 the adjustment is so subtle that a lot of you had a hard time trying to figure out what I'm actually doing. But you will see when you do try to do it to a training partner, you're going to be like suddenly the guy's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, crap. Immediately the threat goes from, Theoretical to real. Cyprus is asking, is there a way to transition from split guard and attack the arm slash reverse right away? To an Tommy? Yes. I believe that's your question. To an Tommy, upside down arm lock. From split guard? Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, yeah. But if, to be honest, see, if I'm a split guard, so if I'm here, if I if I already, yeah, if I'm here, the only reason I would attack is if I start, if I feel like I don't have a good, good angle. Yes. So there's a very easy transition. So to, to some extent, I consider Onegatami uh, almost like a part of the split guard system. A, a lot of that is described in, in greater detail in that on-bar video. There's got to be at least... Uh, I, guys, believe I have not seen it. I hope they did a good job editing. But uh, uh, we, I'm not sure they did. But um, It's not that on-bar video. It's a DVD. DVD, yeah. DVD. Although apparently it cannot be physical. It has to be downloaded. Anyways, um, I think there's like four hours of footage. So, yes, you can transition from split guard uh, into upside down, you know, with a time arm bar. Um, it's a very subtle shift. The only reason I would ever do it again is, is if, if, you know, I put him in split, split guard and he starts to pull out, I just sit up and we're back to threat. Uh, guys, pay it, look at my feet. Look what my feet are doing. They're pushing. And if he's moving his hips, they're following very closely, but there's tension in them. <laughs> Without tension, it's a dramatic difference. And let me pull it up. I still want to answer one more question from, from Greg regarding the split guard. So if it does go awry. So this is, so uh, I guess Greg has a problem where uh, the guy drops it on his leg. He's, I hope I hope I got this. When this happens, your best bet is to, because, right, you know, he's going to start passing the guard. So before that happens, I'm going to anchor my heel between his shoulder and his ear. Once we're here, I'm going to reach, like I'm reaching into my back pocket to pull out a gun to shoot him with. And that gun is called tap, tap, tap. arm over plata. I just shot him with arm over plata. Is that the sound of the gun? <laughs> no, don't even get me started. <laughs> Guys, as you can tell, we've missed this because we can't help ourselves. All right, so let's look at it. <laughs> it's going to be now in my head. So Greg had a problem where the guy just drops in. So before, as, as he's dropping in, you're going to lose it. All right, so as soon as he drops in, you're gonna bring the leg between his shoulder and his ear, and you're gonna pivot your body away. Very important. You can't just try to do it from here. All right, one more time. So, so split guard. Now, what I'm gonna do is, I have isolated his arm, but I have nothing to, you know, he can still move it, he doesn't feel a lot of danger. Again, guys, there's tension gonna be in your ankle, in your, in your foot, to make sure that he cannot sort of move around, all right? So before he overpowers you, once he can get his arm forward, he can overpower you. So before that happens, I'm going to reach into my pocket, for my own, and I pivot my body even further away. I connect, again, tap, and keep his... Guys, the more you keep his arm bent, so you don't want to be doing it here. You want to keep his arm bent. And I can do it with my body, just... Any, I make adjustments with my body to keep that in. And now we have, for lack of a better term, a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> at some point I'm going to come after you. I lost my train of thought. What I call it, arm omoplata. All right. <laughs> Please, more questions before. <laughs> I'm going to tip your mouth shut. <laughs> GM Baseball said, great, thank you. I can't wait to hear the gunshots from Uke today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's probably going to be cries of pain. Uh, any other questions on this so far before we start to move forward? Uh, yes, one last one from Elat Sapir. He says, when I try to apply a split guard with both feet on the hips, I don't have pressure on this elbow. I have to pull my leg closer to me. Uh, what am I doing wrong? On which side? On the on the isolated on the arm that you're attacking? He says, "I'm talking about the the leg that catches the hand." Because the side the hand is under the arm. So yeah. So. Yeah. So okay. here we we're here we're in split guard, right? There's a couple of problems with this right now. 
Uh, I'm flat on my back. There's no tension in my feet and my legs are jammed up. So they don't have a lot of power. So what I would try to do is I would get my hips up and as they're coming down, start to stretch them out. And I always keep that thigh close. There's two reasons. One is, so his arm is basically wedged between my inner thigh and my torso, all right? So I basically put the pressure on through the leg. However, it has a second purpose too. It, it prevents him from retracting that arm. So he can only, he cannot pull it sort of towards the elbow. He has to pull it in straight line. Because he's pulling it in a straight line, it actually increases the pressure on his joints. So you want to be in this position and tension in your feet. Sometimes if my foot is not, my left foot is properly not staying on his hip, I can bring it inside. Stop, 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 stop. All right. Uh, from here, Enrique only has, he, yeah, that's the only option. Well, go ahead. He has to start turning weight. So you got to be careful, like one of the possible things, once guys start to get caught in it, you got to maintain the tension to make sure they actually turn away pretty, pretty much, pretty much away because. Say hello to the camera, Enrique. Um, so you have to keep the tension in so he stays turning away in the same direction. You don't want to lighten up on the tension because sometimes what happens, they double back. Oh, we only have 10 minutes. Do we have any other questions on the split guard sort of troubleshooting? Okay, perfect. So the next question is, guys, uh, this is... Uh, uh, David uh, sent me from Canada, sent me some questions. Guys, uh, the best way to get your questions answered is, is literally if you, if you, the live questions will always get precedence over questions that have been sent in in the last few days. Also, guys, please don't send me the questions three weeks before because I can't find them. I try to take screenshots of them, but I, I have a lot of stuff going on. So I, I don't, you know, I forget and then I can't find them. So if, if you're gonna send me questions, it's better like a day, same day or day before, uh, and also uh, live is the best. So, but the, this is a, a good question. And he's like, man, you make it so it looks so easy. How do, you, how do you go through the process? So when you're a white belt, you have a hard time. You don't, you don't have sort of the idea what, what you should be doing. You, it's, it's very difficult for you to get a concept of what am I doing? What, you know, uh, there was some posts on, on Facebook that uh, um, the guy is like, you know, I drilled the move, it kind of works when I drill it and I go live, I get my ass kicked. Well, if you just started, that's what's going to happen because you don't know. And if you do know, you can't execute it in time to counter the, your, your, your training part. So your job at, at White Bell is just try to almost like get comfortable being uncomfortable and observe what's going on and try to react at, at the very least. If you start to realize what is happening and what the problem is, that is the first step. And that doesn't change in your process going forward, even when you get to blue, purple, brown, black. It doesn't change, okay? So when you start to identify the problem, so if say you're a, a purple belt and you have a problem with something, whatever technique it is. So your training partner is thwarting you. So first, you have to identify the problem. Obviously, your teacher is the best, best place to ask. Uh, if you don't have, if you live in a town where you know, there is not somebody high level that you can't ask, um, because you know, if you have a good teacher, they can accelerate that process significantly. Uh, but you need to figure out what is the problem, what is happening. Then you come up, again, this is where your teacher comes in, you come up with a solution, okay? You drill the solution. Now, if the solution is not working, again, this is where a good teacher comes in, they can tell you what you're doing uh, wrong with the attempted solution. 
So it could be the wrong solution or maybe your execution of the solution is not right. So if it's, if it's wrong solution, you, you need to come up with a different solution. Again, good teacher or good training partners can accelerate that significantly. Um, once you have the solution, you drill it. You drill the solution to make sure that your execution is, is good. And then you do it live. And now it works. Suddenly your problem has been solved. Until your training partners catch on and start to come up with counters to your solution. And now you have to go through the process all over again. That's why jujitsu is basically a never ending arms race. The minute you figure you have all the answers, you probably should quit because at that point, if you think you know everything, even if you do know everything, the game changes. It becomes more and more progressively, more and more technical. People are always coming up with, maybe it's, it's an old school move or a move that's been used for 80 years, but now it's, it's been fine tuned. You know, it's had a turbocharger put into it, you know? So guys, that is the process that I use constantly. You know, he, he knows like he's him and Mike are my regular training partners. Anytime, you know, when it works, I'm happy, I'm happy. And then suddenly he starts to take it away from me, starts to take it away from me. And if I, if I stick with it and, you know, he starts taking, not just taking it away from me, but punishing me for sticking to it too long. Then I try to come up with a solution. If it works, I drill it, I play around with it, make sure it's fine tuned. Then I start hitting him again until he comes up. And it's just a never ending sort of, um, what is it, quest for perfection. Cycling. Cycling. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, so that's, uh, that's sort of how the process of improvement works, and I don't think that process will change dramatically from the time you're white-blue to when you're black. It's just that uh, the problems are different. All right? Uh, do we have any questions on that? Because I, I, have, I have one more big point that I want to make before we, we uh, close today. No, no. What's the question? Uh, we have a check-in from Atika from DSC Gym in Czech Republic. What's going on? And Anand is asking, Coach, uh, how can you make jiu-jitsu more fun for kids or the best way to make them like jiu-jitsu? Sorry for the off-topic question. Oh, man. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, uh, I grew up in a <laughs> different, different, different time frame, so <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm the right person to be asked that question. Uh, you know, I, I think... I can make jiu-jitsu fun for adults because I think adults can see that it's fun for me and I can try to explain to them why, uh, why, uh, you know, why it should be fun and how to approach learning. Don't look at it as a, you know, win-lose proposition every time you go train. You look at it more as you're accumulating knowledge. Now, I think you can apply a little bit of that to kids, but with kids, it's, there is no one answer because kids go through different stages of development and you cannot have the same answer to a seven-year-old that you would to a 13-year-old. So you have to really dig deeper into that, uh, you know, because the seven-year-olds, you want to almost disguise, uh, disguise some, of the, uh, some of the lessons, some of the classes, you teach them a little bit of technique, you, you play a little bit of uh, games, hopefully, that can actually help them improve their technique, improve their timing, improve their concentration. Uh, but a 13-year-old is going to have a different problem, you know. Uh, so you will have to approach the 13-year-olds or 14-year-olds differently. Uh, can be quite the same way as you would approach adults or teach adults, but it also is not going to be like you would teach even a, a 9 to 10-year-old. So the different stages of development. So you really want to, if you're really focusing on kids, that's where you want to focus on the different stages of development. How, how do you get through to those stages? And we have two minutes. Guys, so re really before we go off, I really want to make sure that uh, people understand uh, that again, it, it is on, on, on the BJJ Fanatics uh, DVD, I focus on this, and I've, you've heard me say this many times before. Um, I, the guards I personally like to play is either split guard 
or the perpendicular graph. So if you are, if you like my game, if you like, if you, if you have similar personality to mine, similar outlook on what jujitsu should be like, uh, then you should, you know, this is sort of the way uh, you should model your guards, perhaps. The reason for that is if I, I, a split guard is great because as soon as I put somebody in split guard, first of all, it's great for self-defense, MMA, as well as jiu-jitsu. They're basically trapped and they have to make a move. If they don't make a move, I'm going to hit them with short arm lock. If they move, you have triangle, on plata, inverted arm lock. They're on the run. At the very least, I will get a sweep out of that. So, so now, then I'm on top. The other possibility is if they move in. If they move in, guys, I don't want to be lined up underneath them because now if I'm lined up underneath them, they can either hit me with, you know, again, from an MMA self-defense perspective, they can start hitting you. Uh, also, uh, you know, it's harder for me to, you know, when they come in, they could control your hips a little bit better. I don't want that. So the minute somebody penetrates, goes from split guard into sort of closes the gap, and now their head is almost above mine, what I want to make sure that they're not, I want them either far out or on top of me, not in between. Okay, where they can control my legs, they can start to pass. I want them either stretched out, perpendicular door, um, split guard, or once they start to come in, I actually accelerate to where they're on, uh, on top of me and I start to pivot and take their base away and I start to attack. So those are two, my, two of my preferred guards. I just want to, before we, we sign off, I just want to go through that. So, you know, I have split guard here. I'm attacking Enrique. Enrique's done a good job to, to my uh, feet came off his, his hips. So right now, I don't, I can't let Enrique posture up because now he would be passing. This would be a, a guard pass now. And now I'm re, uh, reacting defensively. So before that happens, so as this is slipping off, I'm already going perpendicular. I defy anybody to hit me from here. Go ahead. Let me have my hand back. Okay. <laughs> so you can see how that perpendicular guard could be extremely brutal. Uh, just so you know, I've been playing with this for six to nine months. It is covered in detail on that DVD. Uh, I do have uh, sort of a happy and an unhappy thing about it. Uh, I, my guys are now playing with it as well. Uh, Mike probably more so than anybody else. In the last two weeks, he's nailed me with it twice. Part of me was very happy and proud that he's done such a good job, and part of me was, I knew it was coming, and I couldn't stop it. And we have uh, two things before we close out. Can somebody tell me what episode this is? Because I really don't know. 11. 11. Okay. Because we screwed up on the last one. I think we said I episode did. 9 and it was actually 10. Okay, yes. Two more questions. Uh, GM Baseball says, I just wanted to mention that being put in the Noki Baseball bat choke is brutal. I gain even more appreciation for Enrique for taking the paint for us in the antivirus editions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bro. <laughs> just so you know, when I hit him with the baseball bat choke, I usually will just literally pause there to give them a chance if they want to fight this or tap. I don't put it on real hard. And what's the other thing? And uh, one last question before we close out. Piotr is asking... What's how up, Piotr? We missed you. He says, how do you explain to your students how to flow roll? Have you got any other solution other than teaching them the hard way if they don't understand that it's good to have different gears? Uh, well, if, if somebody tells me they get a flow roll and they, they don't, I try to explain it to them and then teach them the hard way. But if you got two guys in your class that are flow rolling and they're turning purple and huffing and puffing, I'm saying, guys, the idea of a flow, and, and people need to understand what flow roll means. It means you move at a lower intensity. Doesn't mean that you flop around. You need to move it in, in, in a sort of, um, in a way that lowers the intensity, but with precision. So good timing, good precision. 
So yes, submissions should be allowed in a flow roll because if somebody falls into a submission, you're not going to just let him out because he made a mistake. He needs to understand that he made a mistake. A flow roll is, is sort of like a, a slower way to test out your game where you can see your mistakes as they're happening rather than just going real fast, real hard, and you don't really realize what's going on. So it, it takes time, especially guys that are used to high level intensity and, and just banging, banging their head against the wall. Uh, they don't understand it. Sometimes it takes three to six months, but that's, you know, I usually, when I see two of my students doing that, I'm like, listen guys, you could really need to lower the intensity. The one way that you can actually make a rule is, is, is um, especially if you have two guys that are about the same level uh, to flow roll is almost uh, one for one, one submission for one submission. So it means however long it takes, one guy gets a submission and then the other guy doesn't give him the submission, but kind of lets it happen as it's happening when it gets to a point where it's technically done at the right timing. So that's another way if you, if you really have a hard time with it, one for one. But it's, you know, one guy could submit the other guy in 30 seconds, the other guy could take three and a half minutes because he just didn't get there. But that also means that should show him that his game is not adequate enough to create submissions in a, in a fairly timely manner. All right, guys, we're out of time. We'll see you uh, episode 12 uh, of the regular edition. I don't know what day that's going to be in September. <laughs> the antibody edition. The what? The antibody edition. The antibody edition. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll see you next time. I got to go take care of him now. <laughs>